Welcome back to the CX Insider Podcast. This month, the Euros have had us on the edge of our seats, so we've decided to bring you two special football-themed episodes. In our second fan experience episode, we sit down and talk to the CEO of two-time FA Cup winners, Berry FC. We talk about the club's journey now being owned by fans, as well as the power of volunteers in the sporting world. Enjoy the episode, and if you do, subscribe to our YouTube channel for more CX Insider content. This episode is brought to you by ACF Technologies, global leaders in customer experience management solutions. Now, let's get into the episode. Welcome back to CX Insider Podcast. I'm your host Octavian and I'm joined by Simon and we have a special guest today that goes by the name of Neil. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and your career journey? Yeah, no problem. Thanks for thanks Octavian for having me on the uh, having me on the show and the podcast. Yeah, my journey it's quite I think it's quite interesting. Most people would probably say I have two sorts of careers or refer sometimes to what's known as a bit of a previous life. So, I finished college you know, sort of 20 odd years ago, I didn't go to university at the time. And then I fell into retail management and worked as a fresh food manager and checkout manager for Safeway, which it was back then before it was renamed uh, and merged with Morrison's. And my career then evolved into working in telecoms. It was the height of obviously telecoms back in the late 90s when not everyone had a phone. So uh, I worked for major brands such as BT Cellnet, uh, the car phone warehouse, T-Mobile. And then my, my career sort of started gathering at pace, probably late 2008, 2009, whereas I, I went to work for Carphone Warehouse and I was a, worked in one of their elite stores as a branch manager. But then I had the urge to go into field management. So I went to work for brands such as Sainsbury's as, a, as an area manager. I also worked for uh, Benton's Fed Steinhoff. Then I ended up working for William Hill as a, as a regional director, which was an amazing job because sports met sports my passion so getting a job working working in sports was was fantastic but then uh, due to some changes in the gambling legislation in 2019 which some of the uh, listeners might might be aware of a, a lot of land-based bookmakers were his lab books uh, William Hill etc uh, the, the shops pretty much sh- shut in half due to the amount of staking that could be put on a, on a bet at the time on, on some of the machines that were in place and then the pandemic hit so uh, as a result I reevaluated what I wanted to do whether I was happy with what I was doing, I hit 40, you know, the magic number. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to make a career change, it's got to be now. Everywhere was shut, you know, for eight or nine months, as you remember back in those days, strange days. And I decided to start looking at university degrees that I could potentially do in sport, effectively starting again, hopefully with having some strong transferable skills. I went to study at the university campus of football and business, which is called UCFB, based out of the Etihad Stadium. And I did a three-year sports law degree, graduated last June, came out with a first class with honours. So I was pretty made up with that. And my intention was to then get a career in, in football. You are now at Bury FC, so can you tell us a little bit about the club itself and the journey it's taken in the last decade? So for people who don't know, the club was established in, in 1885 and had a very successful uh, history within a football league. They've won the FA Cup before, they've been as high as the, champi- as the championship as we know it today. But then unfortunately, due to some ownership decisions regarding selling of the club, etc., it went through and it was, this was highly publicised in the news and, you know, there's been documentaries on it on BBC iPlayer, etc. The, the club went effectively bust in 2019 and that meant it got expelled from the Football League, which was pretty unprecedented at the time. A lot was done to try and save it, but they couldn't save it in the end and the club went bust. Now, what, what that meant was it obviously went bust with, with debts, etc., and what that meant was that if the club wanted to come back, they'd have to start right from the bottom. And for any fans who don't know, just to try and put this into context, you know, you've got your Premier League, which is obviously tier one, championship tier two, league one, league two, and national league. Most people follow up to sort of national league is, is level five. So the bottom of the football pyramid is level 10. So we're currently in tier nine and we're hopefully looking to get promoted to tier eight. So what that means is in terms of the, the Berry journey. So wh- when it went bust in, in 2019, there's a group of fans wanted to try and resurrect it and come back as a, a as a fan and club. So then it was resurrected at first as Berry AFC. And a lot of that's to do with the actual name itself, the entity and the company's house, you know, the debts that weren't were going with it. So there was a group of fans who then formed a club called Berry AFC. 
and they didn't play at Gig Lane, so no one played at our home stadium. It was, you know, sort of here still, it was overgrowing, but it, obviously the, the firm had gone bust. And there was also another group of fans who wanted to, wanted to come back as its original entity, as Berry FC. There was then a group of fans known as the, the Benefactors, etc., which then effectively purchased the stadium. So then we had a stadium here, which people owned the stadium, but the football team was, was down the road playing at Radcliffe doing a ground share where Berry AFC were. And then, long story short, there was a vote to amalgamate them and bring those two entities back together and effectively then reform what is a version of Berry FC. And then we came back into this stadium. So this is the first season back in Gig Lane. Toughest, hardest thing, I guess, to get your head around is the fact that we're in League 9, as I would call it, but we've got a full stadium that seats 12,000, whereas every other League 9 ground you go to holds about, you know, anything between sort of five and 1500 those teams won't have all the infrastructure costs and everything that we have so we have we have everything that a league two club that, that you know would have in terms of events hospitality a full stadium but we obviously don't get the broadcast revenue so you know there is only three forms of revenue you can earn as a football club which is your commercial and sponsorship your match day attendances and then your broadcast revenue well if you don't have the broadcast revenue that's a it's about an eight hundred thousand pound dent in our pocket through not having that as in League Two. So if you went down the road to a League Two stadium, you know, for example, somewhere like Salford, they would have similar crowds to us at probably about 3,000, but they would get obviously some broadcast revenue. The average crowd in our league, just to put that into context, is about 300 and we're getting about 3,000. <laughs> so yeah, oh, wow. that's, a, that's a bit about how Berry was almost, well, it, it did go bust now, it's come back from the, from the dead. Uh, in terms of then my journey, so I finished university and ideally wanted to be a club secretary. My, my degree was all around learning all the nuances within the rules and, and things and profit and sustainability and financial fair play and, and, and everything that's probably very topical in the news at the moment. And I finished university in June 23. Football can be very difficult to break into. So on my journey, while I was at university, I, you know, I, I did some stewarding at Manchester United. I did some volunteering at the UEFA Women Euros, went on an internship at Burnley called The Hive, which was a brand new program they were doing. It was pretty much a running joke that anything there was at university, it was extracurricular that I, that I would stick my hand up for it. But even with all that going on, it's still a very tough nut to crack. And especially the league secretary position, because ultimately, if you go into a football club and you're the league secretary, if you get something wrong, you're going to get a points deduction. So clubs are very cautious about taking people on who haven't been a club secretary before so what you generally find is if you do any research like like i did at the time looking at all the 92 secretaries within the football league and the premier league pretty much everyone's previous position had been a secretary at another club even though i'd worked at a very senior level in my previous life as i refer to it even to try and get a job at sort of 30 grand a year was difficult because people were seeing me as a uh, the one, the one thing I didn't consider when I went to uni, whereas I thought I'd have some skills that I could bring across, what I didn't probably anticipate at the time was people were going to be almost scared that my background was too senior to come in at a lower level. So that then presented challenges that I hadn't even considered. There was an opportunity where Barry came along to come in as a club secretary part-time, almost as a bit of a volunteer basis, really, just to help them out because the previous secretary was, was stepping down. I came in at the club in, in November, and obviously did that for a couple of months, built some key relationships. Like I said, football's about relationships. So once you've established that trust and you've got a foot in the door, obviously it helped. You know, if I was probably 21 years old walking out of uni, I'm not saying that I'd get the job I'm in now. It obviously helped with my senior, uh, previous senior experience. However, once I'd obviously built some relationships with people at the club and, and gained that trust and they probably could see what I, was, I could do, the opportunity to become the CEO within the football club. Yeah, here, here I am now. So I'm CEO and... Club Secretary of, of Berry. What inspired you to make that move to CEO? You know, I, I had this view of I wanted to be a club secretary because of a new what it entailed, and that's what the degree had prepared me for. I knew the sort of salaries that go along with that as you work up the football pyramid, so that almost tallied up as well. But when I went for an interview at another football club in December. I'd only been secretary here for a short period of time. Like I said, it was practically a volunteer role so that I was really honest with the club about where, where I was heading. And I went for this interview with a, with a football league club for a head of administration, not too dissimilar from club secretary. And during that interview process, they, they actually said to me, have you ever thought of being a, a club CEO? Because of, because of the level you'd worked at before, you probably wouldn't be far away. 
from being able to operate within the football league at a CEO level. And it just got my head thinking about, well, actually, yeah, my previous experience, you know, I've managed teams up to 1,200 people. I've managed turnovers of over 100 million. When, when I started to think about it, I thought, well, actually, yeah, that's something I've, I've not really thought of. So it was an idea that was put into my head. And these things are all about timing because, funnily enough, I was doing the, I was doing the part-time club secretary. I've been trying to get a job in football for five or six months and just keep, get, get hitting my head on a brick wall. And I decided to almost go back to my old world. So I, I got a job in December. The minute I applied for a job in my old world, I got it straight away. So even though I had a lot of knockbacks within football, it, you know, I was always thinking, what's going on here? This is just weird. As soon as I applied for a job, I went with the gambling commission. I got it straight away. So, you know, that improved my own confidence for there. Well, okay, it wasn't anything I was doing at an interview or anything. It was just because I hadn't worked in football. So you were getting put in a box. So I got a job with the gambling commission uh, as a governance and stakeholder manager. And on the side, I would carry on doing Berry club secretary. I'd only been with the gambling commission sort of six, seven weeks. And then I got, I got the phone call and it was like bad timing in one way, because I've, you know, just been through a process, <laughs> a, a two stage interview to go to get something else. But you know, when something turns up, that's, you know, effectively not far from home and in the position that it's in and trying to resurrect this big club, like I said, it's not just a, a tier nine club. It's all the history and tradition was with it. A former FA Cup winners. You can't really turn down that kind of opportunity. Going back to Berry FC's board, how difficult is board communication now that the club is merged into four? And what are the four segments that make up the club? The club is split into, into different parts. It's effectively four distinct entities involved in the operation of, of the stadium at Berry Football Club. So first of all, you have the Football uh, Supporters Society of Berry, which is called the FSSB. Uh, you then have the Berry Football Club Limited. You then also have the Berry Football Club 2009 Limited. And then you have the Berry FC Benefactors. And to be fair, no matter how many times I read it, I still, I still struggle to get my head around uh, it all. What I'd say is I b believe in making things really simple. So I believe in strong communication, first of all, with the fans, second of all, with the stakeholders, and then and thirdly, with the board. So, you know, I report into the football board. And they report report into what we call the CBS board. I and mean, you know, we'll have monthly meetings with that with those uh, board meetings with those people and I'll update them on progress. The biggest challenge I've seen, and this will probably affect all non-league football, is the fact that everyone's got a full-time day job. My day is is effectively nine till five or or meant to be nine till five, let's say, although football doesn't work like that. You know, so I, I generally probably work quite long hours. You can maybe get to half six, quarter to seven when I'm thinking of, of getting off home. Well, most people's day jobs are finishing then, so my phone will, will start ringing because they want to speak to me about certain things. So really, it's it's 24-7. I mean, the, the, the only day off really is probably a Sunday, and uh, that's probably where I'm not getting contacted too much. All the other days, are, you know, it's, it's full steam ahead, et cetera. But the board are really good here. You know, the board let me let me do what I need to do to, to run the football club. I'll keep my breast of any events. You know, no one's micromanaging me. Uh, as long as I keep them updated on, on, on events. And the, like I said before, it's establishing that trust. So once that trust is there and you've built those relationships with your stakeholders, that they'll trust your judgment on what, on what you're trying to do moving forward. So, you know, obviously I've joined at a time where full time, if you like, where we had a couple of months left of the season, we're going for automatic promotion. The pitch is getting ripped up next Tuesday and we're getting a 3G pitch laid. So that's a massive pro CapEx project working with communities, etc. We just had a, a service yesterday, which was on, on BBC TV, Northwest Tonight, did a, a quick clip on it because we've had many families, as ashes have been scattered on our pitch and urns have been buried and we needed to make sure that we did the right thing by the, those people in terms of that recognition. So. There's a lot of moving parts and although I'd say I'm CEO here, you know, there's there's so many things that I'd be across in a CEO in a CEO of a normal football club, you you probably just wouldn't get to touch. Now let's dive into the rules surrounding non-league and player transfers. How do they compare to rules and FFP in top flight leagues? This is one of the biggest things I came across when I first came to the club because I'd I'd been learning all the rules and the transfer rules and the financial fair play. Uh, on the degree, but I've been learning it in the league. Now, now you go to non-league, it's a complete different different ball game. And and to give you probably the biggest example of that is, so you imagine being a Berry fan. You used to come in in the late nineties, you know, early two thousands. You see new regular players; they're all under contract, one, two, three year deals. You, you're building relationships with the players. You get an affinity with the fans. You can pretty much name the team before you call. 
you know, everyone's got a squad. And it's, you know, as you would know it now within the Premier League, et cetera. What happens in non-league is, so, you know, take us, for example, our, our players have full-time day jobs, whether they're a plumber, they're an accountant, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll sign one of those players, you'll fill in the registration form to register them with the league that we're in, which is Northwest Counties League. Your manager will agree to deal with them. You know, anything between this level, between probably 100 and 300 pound a week for argument's sake. And those players that you sign that are non-contract, you effectively, you sign Bob Smith, for example, and he would just get paid when he plays. There'd be no contract of employment with it. He would now have he would have no employment rights. He would just get paid and train uh, as as he plays. Now you may decide with call it some of your more top tier players, your 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 better players. You may decide to put them on a contract, and uh, how a normal contract would work. So you know, hundred, two hundred pound a week, and they would get paid regardless whether they played or not. But you've got to bear in mind that's a liability. So when you're trying to manage your 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 assets, your accounts, etc. You don't want too many players on, on contract because otherwise, you know, your manager's then potentially stuck with those players. And another nuance of that is we've had 56 players this season. Now that may seem insane and it probably is, but the way it works is if you're Bob Smith and, and the manager signed you and then he's not picked you to play for a couple of weeks, another club can come into you and say, okay, we want to give you seven days notice permission to speak to that player. And that player's not under contract. So if that, that player doesn't want to stay and the manager doesn't want him to stay, that player can then just move to another club seven days later, no fees, nothing, and, and then just move somewhere else. So you can pretty much see that if you're not getting picked or if you have a change of manager, we have a change of manager sort of uh, eight or nine weeks into this season. New manager comes in, you know, he's only got three or four players on a contract. The rest of them, well, if he doesn't fancy them, he'll, he'll, train, he'll potentially change the team around, go and sign a load more players. So... It's very difficult for the fans to get an affinity with the players because if you don't stick around for that long, and obviously it makes the secretary job, you know, more difficult because you're constantly having to be on your toes regarding making sure players are signed, etc. So how does that work with um, the players that you've got now that you you're effectively owned by the fans? Do they do they try and have an input on the team selection on what players are there? Does that make life a little harder for the manager, or is it? So what I'd say is, as a fan-owned club, so we publish our accounts every month. And, you know, fans will, you know, for fan ownership club, they pay £5 a month, they're members, and uh, they're then a member of an owner of the football club. You know, and we'll have anything between sort of 1,400 and, you know, over 2,000 members, for example. They'll all pay their £5 each a month, and that's obviously a revenue generator as well, and that will give them votes on important matters such as when we when we change a kit, colours, stripes, etc., so that they'll get votes on key mats. Regarding the question you've asked around that he, yeah, you get your usual people on Twitter, on social media, that's no different to how it is higher up the football pyramid. Uh, what I'd say is you get a bit more scrutiny on the account. So we just published some accounts and I've had to field some questions around, what well, can you tell me why this is this much money or how much we're spending on wages? And, you know, they'll obviously be more invested in a viewpoint on, on those situations of accounts, you know, but. Going back to what I said before, the most difficult thing for fans to understand that at this, at where we are, we're unique because we're effectively a tier nine club in a League Two stadium. So yeah. fans yeah. rock up to the stadium. They probably think there's a load of a load of staff behind the scenes. There's only actually me and the stadium manager and assistant stadium manager employed here. There's only three people actually employed here. But you're trying to run a stadium and everything that comes with that. So the fans will probably get. You know, if you see more staff getting taken on, you know, they'll see that as a liability because obviously it's going to hit the accounts and they might want that money spent on players. But ultimately, if you're trying to run a football club and get promoted back to where you think you should be, you ultimately need the infrastructure in place to be able to do that. Because if you just spend the money on, on players' wages, then you'll quickly fall over. You mentioned earlier, actually, your job's all about trust and relationships. And uh, I'm, I'm guessing that I kind of hinted with on the last question that, you need to have a good relationship with your board because as you say, you, you need a clear open communication with them, but they're, they're fans as well at the same time. Does that, does that make it sort of easier for you? The fact that you're kind of responsible directly to the people that own the club, where the passion lives and exists. You've got to set your own boundaries and, and your own limits. So, you know, I'm a I'm a Nottingham Forest fan. <laughs> you know, so I'm used to trials and tribulations over the years. And what I'd say is, you know, if I go on any 
forest fan feed or, or anything, you know, you're always going to have loads of opinions and that's great because that's what makes football. Yeah. No, no, no one's right. No one's wrong. That it's all debate in it. You go down the pub on a Saturday night, you want to discuss the game. The way I, the way I see it is I have certain rules. So I, I don't interact on social media at all because I've never win that. I've never win that battle. There'll always be someone who will think differently. And, and to be fair, it would just take my mind off the day job. So do I move on social media? Yeah, before I go to bed at night, I'll have 10 minutes on it just to get the mood music, as I call it, see what people are saying, see what the key issues are. But generally, yeah, I, I won't reply at all. I won't reply at all. I use LinkedIn, or I'll probably go on LinkedIn, and, and it, but you generally don't get too much on LinkedIn, as you know, it's more business related. But the third thing I identified when I came in is that I wanted to have a clear, clear communication with the fans. So because there was a small percentage of the fan base who didn't think we were as transparent as, as potentially we should have been. And that's something I picked up on, on social media. So I set up a, a effectively a, a Q&A each month. So the fans send in questions. I then categorize them into, into all the key areas. And then I go on camera once a month and uh, try and answer all those questions. They aren't vetted. I answer anything that anyone asks me. And I also make myself available on, on match days. I, I write a program now probably once every four weeks and say, you know, real shout out to people if they see me in the stands, which they hopefully do. Uh, they can come and grab me. They can ask. They can ask me anything. Uh, I want to make sure I have that relationship with the the supporters. We're going to do a fans forum in the summer as well with with the manager, some of the board, and myself. But you know, you, you've got to you've got to give it access, but you've also got to be careful with how much access because then, you know, if you start, you know, in my previous businesses, I'd always want to reply to emails within twenty four hours. It was all almost my my service level agreement that I had with myself. But once people get your email at football and you try and answer an email, that they'd be constantly emailing you and, and literally I wouldn't do any work because I'd just be answering my email all day. That That's for me, that's an advantage of, of me setting up a structure that allows a Q&A with the fans to say, okay, well, this is your time. I'm answering every question and get it all in, in, in one area. And then that gets recorded and sent out across our socials and, and website, et cetera. That's interesting, isn't it? And you mentioned earlier, obviously, League Two Stadium, but clearly not with the staff to back up uh, what a League Two stadium would normally have. And, and I'm guessing a lot of your staff, probably all of them then, are volunteers. So I guess the question is, how do you keep volunteers who are unpaid, but fans of the club, interested and keep coming in to help you because you 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 need them to survive, don't you? Yeah. So, yeah, one of the first things I did when I got here, I, I, I thought, God, there's a lot of volunteers around. I want to get a handle on how many to wear. We've got a volunteer coordinator called Sam who, you know, but what the great thing is about here is that don't forget everyone's a fan. So whereas you might think it's difficult to almost keep a volunteer, these volunteers are literally ingrained within the football club. If you, if you cut their arm, they, they bleed blue and white. Okay. Right. So it's not as difficult as you may think. However, we, we certainly shouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, be taken for granted. Let me put it that way. Uh, so, uh, I did an exercise over the last couple of weeks. So I wanted to look at the skill sets of our volunteers, and we did we did this Google form to see how many volunteers we had, and we have 115 volunteers. They can be involved in anything from match day operations, whether it's on the turnstiles, litter picking, you know, helping out at different areas, or it can be on the internal side, which is you know part of the commercial team, part of our media team, and within all those areas, we have almost like a senior person with it within each area to sort of bring it all together. And, you know, it was only actually Friday night we had a volunteer night where we uh, got all the volunteers together, you know, gave them all a drink and we had a, a really good uh, evening together where we were able to recognise the volunteers, et cetera. So, nice. and something that struck me when I was in that room on Friday night was that it must have been 90 people attended. And it was just the best way I can describe it to you is it's just like having one family there. Everyone wanted to work together for the best of the football club They've been through all the journey over the last 25 years, all the ups, all the downs, and they want the best for the club. They just want to make sure decisions are being made at the right time for the fans and, and then they're happy to be steered in, in, in that right direction. So, you know, I think where where the club was heading, hopefully with promotion, with any luck, you know, we needed to now start looking at taking staff on uh, because, you know, your volunteers will get you to a certain point but ultimately, what I'm always aware of is encroaching on people's time too much. You know, there's probably two or three people I really, really lean on, and I'm always slightly feel guilty in my own mind before I phone and think they've got a day job as well. You know, you have to be really, you know, to go from having 1,200 people working for me to having two. 
you know, and you can't pick up the phone and get something done. It's pretty much you need to do it yourself. So yeah. that takes a bit of getting your head around, to be fair. If you do go up to the next league, what what happens for you? I assume you get more revenue streams in, more ability to hire staff. You can kind of look and attract better players. Is that is that the case? Well, again, this is quite a tricky one. So we'll go into the Northern Premier League if we go up, which will obviously be tier eight. And listen, does, is that going to is that everyone going to put more runs on seats? Probably not. Not too many. Is it going to mean much more prize money? Probably not. Will we put more many more players in the contract? Probably not. No, nothing changes too much apart from the fact that Berry want to get back to where they were. You know, it's certainly, certainly, definitely the National League, and that will carry on the feel the factor. You could argue if we don't go up, some of those fans might think, well, okay, they lose their enthusiasm a bit. Some of the ones who maybe just come along for the ride and then we don't go up. I think it's important that we go up from that point of view. But listen, if we if we don't go up and it doesn't work out, then we'll obviously have another stab. There's always next year in football, isn't there, right? That's, that's the best phrase ever. So what is the vision for the club? Where does Neil see them heading in the next five to ten years? Yeah, I mean, I mean, listen, the, the, the most important thing is we need to maximise our, our, our commercial revenue that's coming in. And for me, the club, even though it's in a 12,000-seater stadium, even when we were in the championship, I think we only had about 5,000. So we're not going to sit here and say we're going to go and get 12,000 fans. It just won't happen. There's too many other big clubs, you know, Man United, Man City, in this world nearby. However, what we can do is, if you think from a revenue driver, if we get communities involved, we get schools involved, we get fans who they can't go to United, they've been priced out of it, or the mum and dad want to get the, the seven-year-old back involved in football or, or the first-time fan experience. So we're making sure that with the introduction of this 3G pitch, we'll be able to have 50 hours a week played on our pitch. We'll be able to rent our pitch out. That will get a lot more eyes on it that have never been here before. A lot of visitors who've never been here before. A lot of businesses who've never been here before. And that should organically start to raise attendances. If you get that along with a decent field with factor, and then maybe look at getting a fan experience manager in and having a fan zone built outside, you know, just to go from 3,000 to 6,000 seats over a two-year period. I mean, that's roughly another 240K a year match day revenue. That allows you then to get the staff in to build and at the moment you know everyone's got great ideas at the club but in terms of executing you know ultimately there's only so many hours one person can do right <laughs> you know i've already started mapping out you need a head of commercial whether that be a part-time person you need a fan experience manager you need an hr person you need an events manager you need a receptionist you know that there's five heads there that you just add the salaries up there even if you ballpark at an average salary there's 120 grand you know you, you can't take those revenues on so it's a, it's a lot of it's a lot of chicken and an egg, you know, because the club don't want to go bust. We've been there before. The fans don't want to see you taking on, you know. There's a certain section of the fan base which, if you again, if you follow social media, it's like, well, why is Neil there? We don't need Neil. We can just run the club off volunteers. But you can't run a a full stadium, you know, and everything that goes with it, hospitality, match day operations. You can't just run that off volunteers. You just can't do it. And that concludes the end of the episode. Thank you to everyone for listening. I've been Octavian and I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. Let us know what you think by carrying on the conversation on LinkedIn. This episode has been brought to you by ACF Technologies, global leaders in customer experience management solutions. Now let's get into some quick fire questions. What was your favourite football player growing up? Oh, favourite football player growing up? I think it would have to be... Well, one or two. Either Stuart Pearce, because I'm obviously a Forest fan, and, you know, one of the best left-backs in the world, plus just his his pure emotion and energy that he had for the game. Or more exciting player, I guess, someone like Stan Collymore. So I first started going to football. I went to the 91 FA Cup final when I was Mm -hmm. 14. Obviously, didn't didn't see Collymore then because he came along a bit later. But just as I probably started getting into football properly after the 90 World Cup, then, yeah, Colin Moore came along, I think, in nine, mid-90s. And he was just, uh, for two years, he was unplayable before we went to uh, before we went to Liverpool. Speaking of Nottingham Forest, because you played yesterday, I want to ask, what are your thoughts on Chris Wood? Oh, well, this, yeah, this is a really <laughs> winning one, right? Because uh, we signed him for Newcastle for £15 million, And it was like, oh, my God, that's a lot of money for Chris Wood. And he came in and he was a backup striker to Tyro, Tyro Ioni. And then Rainey got injured and went and, and went away. And Wood came in, and I, he couldn't have armed at all. He was literally awful. And Steve Cooper got to a stage where we just didn't, we didn't play about a striker because he just didn't have any faith in him. Uh, Cooper then got sacked. And the first thing Nuno did was bring Wood back in. 
And I saw some crazy stats out there before this, before yesterday. He had the best strike rate in the whole Premier League in terms of minutes per goal and shots on target. 40% of his shots go in. So Whoa. he's absolutely clinical. He's already got 11 or 12 this season. He's only played in half the games. Yeah, I mean, he's absolutely been ripping it up. And then yesterday, the one day where we just needed to stick the chances <laughs> away, I mean, let's be honest, he had two or three. Um, yeah. I think there's some, again, some crazy stats doing the internet. Forrest had the highest XG against any team against Man City in the last in the last 12 years or something. You know, and we played well. We played well yesterday. We shouldn't have lost that game. Yeah. Look away the two golden opportunities, yeah. Me personally, I'm relieved because I don't know if you could see behind me, but <laughs> <laughs> you're speaking right. to a City fan. So we yeah. played yesterday. So I mean, that, that first um, half, we, we, we were a better team. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Your expected goals was like double us. Yeah, it, it was crazy. Double half time, real one point three four, and you were zero point three nine. Football was all about putting it in the back of the net, though, wasn't it? Another question I had is, if if you had to support a club outside of the UK, who would it be? Yeah, I do like watching the Champions League just because the excitement it gives you and VAR is dealt with very well as opposed to the Premier League which is complete uh, trash uh, obviously I would say that being a Forest fan considering we keep having so many bad decisions against us you do uh, that, is, that is you do have a lot yeah there's a, there's a real going around Twitter and you know yeah. I, I'm obviously going to buy this because I'm a Forest fan but there's a real going around Twitter I mean, we've had 12 there's 12 bad decisions have gone against us this season most of them are kind of clear cut yeah so what want to know how, how that so, decision was made you know? yeah someone did an, an expected points this season, a bit like XG works, and we should be on 45 points. We, we should be 11th. Yeah. And it's not through missing chances, it's through VAR. You know, I mean, yeah, you'll get me started because I did my dissertation <laughs> on VAR. I have to write a dissertation on VAR, so yeah, you can imagine. But yeah, outside of England, uh, I mean, I enjoy watching Real Madrid. Yeah. Real, Real Madrid uh, didn't surprise me at all when they turned City over. Oh, end. right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right, no, that's that's you because of the Nottingham Forest game. Yeah. That's yeah. that's really- a Nottingham Forest fan speaking because we, <laughs> we we played way better than them. But that's just football. Like you guys played better than us. You should have won. I think we should have won against Real Madrid, but that's football. Sometimes yeah. that happens. Yeah.